Hey, Patrick. Moby, how are you? Good, good. How was your day today? Very good. Did All you right. bike here? I did. I did. I, uh, I guess I actually try to bike here every day when I teach, and it's, uh, it's worked out so far the last couple of years, but I enjoy it. It's a, it's a good kind of way to get a little bit of exercise yeah. in in the mornings and, and the afternoons, too. In the Texas heat, how's that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's harder in the summer uh, certainly. Yeah, uh, mornings actually really aren't that bad. The afternoons are when you you face the brunt of it, especially especially when you, uh, you know, you're stopped at a light and just getting the sun baking down on you. But uh, but I, I I still like doing it. Uh, that won't the heat won't deter me. Good good uh, yeah. Whenever it's too hot, I get lazy and I don't go outside or work out. So that's I should probably take a leaf from your book. Yeah, this, I think this works because you're forced to do it. And then when you're at school and you only took a bike in. Uh, <laughs> the only way it's back, only way back is a bike. <laughs> okay, good. So good. It's, a, it's a good, it forces me to commit to doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so how long have you been at the University of Texas? I've been here for uh, almost seven years now. Uh, what have you taught in the last seven years? A couple different classes, but... Uh, I mostly, I've spent most of my time teaching in our uh, various masters and MBA programs, teaching a class called Financial Statement Analysis. Uh, so I've done a little bit of other things uh, across time, but, but most of the sections and most of the time uh, that I've done is with that particular class. And you've taught also in the Evening MBA, the UTMS TC program, the Executive MBA program, all of these? Yes. Okay, wow. MSF. Uh, MPA program. I've taught in Dallas, MBA program, Houston MBA program. I think that's the. Do you have to drive place. to Houston for the? Uh, yes, we. Yeah, so we wow. go down there for weekends. It's they have a program there in Dallas and Houston, and they import the professors, mm -hmm. and then the uh, you know it's easier for the students who work in that city. It's kind of fun. Uh, it's obviously very useful for them because it disrupts their weekend more. And it's you know you send down two or three professors instead of trying to get 85 students to make their way to Austin every weekend. That's hard. That's hard. And, and uh, that's the case with some people in the class that we met, yes. your class in the yeah. MSTC program. Thank you, Mandy, for the hookup for this. This is fantastic and highly intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some people like drive in from, uh, Sunny, I think, drives in from Louisiana and Houston and Dallas and Tyler from Chicago. And there's people in Indonesia and everywhere else. Right. Yeah, you're uh, on that point. Uh, MSTC program is one of the ones the class I've taught the last couple of years, and you're, you're talking about geographical diversification of where people are coming from. But uh, I find that to be one of the most thrilling classes I teach because the class is so diverse. The backgrounds, the experiences, the comments, the perspectives. Uh, when I introduce things, or and we'll talk a little bit later about you know Amazon and Whole Foods and some other stuff, but I feel like every time I've just mentioned a company that I've used in my financial statement analysis class, when I've thrown it out the MSTC groups the last couple of years, there, there's always a perspective, an insight, something where I'm just, I'll just step back and be like, I haven't, you know, I've looked at this in you know, the last three years, last yeah. four years, and I never would have thought of that. And then some one in that phenomenal and diverse group will be like, yeah, well, what about this or some other angle? And it's, it's a cool experience because uh, I, I, I find it like uh, very enriching, rewarding, and refreshing because of the unexpected nature. And I think it comes because the class is so diverse. You Absolutely. Don't have, you know, it's not a class of students who are all aspiring to become accountants or, you know, more homogenous in many ways, which I think makes it very valuable. Yeah, we're, we weren't here to study accounting. That's why it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a challenge. So. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, that's the thing. We, we, I'm trying to, in that class to teach a ton of accounting to a very intelligent, but just, you know, the backgrounds are not mm -hmm. in that specific area. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge to convey all that information in a short amount of time. But, but I, I don't know. I, hopefully you guys find it bearable. Uh, we and, do. It's uh, fun. <laughs> and uh, so, I've enjoyed it. So do you, do you look at the world and at companies like Whole Foods, like Amazon, through a very financial lens? Is that something you've trained at and got a lot of experience in through your studies and teachings? Yeah, so the, the financial statement analysis class, the one I was mentioning before um, that we have done a lot on, uh, it, it's specifically designed to do 
a very in-depth analysis of individual companies. And, and I usually pitch it as we are trying to use an array of financial information, mm -hmm. the financial statements, the footnotes, the management discussion and analysis, conference calls, articles, whatever, to try to really fully understand the, the drivers of past performance, not just how they did on metrics or ratios, but the business story behind it. And, uh, and then the, you know, the goal of that is well, potentially we can try to give a good perspective for forecasting in the future, or at least having conversations about you know, what could potentially happen next. Uh, it's a, I, I've done it the past many years, spent a lot of time teaching it, have tried in that class to develop all the cases and do the analysis and you know, research specific companies and read analyst reports and try to make sure that I'm as knowledgeable as possible about um, what's going on or what could potentially go on. And, it's exciting to teach because it's very real world. Uh, obviously, it's current events are always at the forefront of that class. Um, and then, you know, occasionally you have big picture things that relate to class and, mm -hmm. and they add an additional level of excitement. Um, it's also interdisciplinary, I think, which, which attracts me to it as well, where there's an opportunity to bring together finance and economics and even a little bit of strategy and, and, and you know, obviously accounting, but, uh, but some of those other areas. Yeah, I never realized how important looking at financial statements, and this is coming from a guy who didn't study in the business school. I did economics, but I shouldn't be saying this. All the professors who taught me would hate me. But I have never realized the importance of looking at, in detail, financial statements to understand where a company was, and then kind of think about where could it go in terms of how it plays with money, how it makes capital budgets, and all that. It was a very interesting class. So let's look at uh, Whole Foods and Amazon. This, is, this was last week. How many text messages? Because <laughs> no. this is one of your favorite topics. Whole Foods, Amazon, Walmart a little bit, and Tesla. Yes. So, uh, and yeah. Apple, I think. Yeah. Those are, it's pretty good. Group. How many email messages and texts did you get that day or week? Yeah, so the, the background there, and, and it's, I, I can only laugh, but uh, uh, the background is I've, I've spent considerable time in that class the last couple of years focusing on pretty in-depth analysis of Whole Foods and also Amazon, and we've touched those other companies too. Um, so when uh, I was actually walking my sons to school that Friday morning, so it was interesting because I was kind of detached and away from the internet. I think I, before it broke, whatever, I was already out, whatever. And uh, I just started getting a whole bunch of texts in my pocket. I was like, what? And I looked at some of them. It was, it was actually one specific former student of mine and good friend. Uh, and to his credit, he's on the West Coast. So he was up early, totally in this, asking me all my thoughts on different aspects of it, whatever else. And, uh, and then you know, emails and everything that came, in, or came after that, where students are all checking in to see what did I think <laughs> yeah. and uh, did I know, whatever else. Um, and uh, I, this is kind of, before we get into the specifics of that, what, I've, what I actually found very refreshing and rewarding is it's, it was a cool opportunity just to touch base with people who I hadn't talked to in some, actually just in a few weeks because the class just ended, um, and others, you know, maybe in a semester or, or a year or two um, who just wanted to, you know, it was a great opportunity to, to reconnect with students. Absolutely. Um, so, so I enjoyed that. It was a, it was a, it was a, Independent of the news, it was a fun day in many yeah. ways. So. And I remember waking up, looking at the news, and then getting uh, messages on Facebook and Canvas saying, wow, Patrick's going to love this. <laughs> and then I was going to interview you about general finance and looking at your personal life through finance and doing all of that. But I saw that I was like, I need to talk about Whole Foods and Amazon. So in your experience, what you've studied, um, how you studied Whole Foods. How has it been doing before this acquisition for the last five, six years? Yeah, so we've, so one of the, the goals, what we've done is really to kind of go back many years to, to get a good amount of data and understanding. Um, and I would, if I can, I would probably put their performance into two general buckets. Uh, they, or maybe more than two buckets, but they were doing well. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they hit a pretty tough year in 2009 related to the recession um, and, and struggled a bit. But I, what I've covered in class and talked about is they bounced back very well from 2009. 2010, 11, 12 were really phenomenal years because 
the overall economy wasn't fully recovered, but, but Whole Foods was generating double-digit sales growth and performing very well. More recently, um, the last couple of years, they've struggled uh, quite a bit. And I think some of those struggles are driven by just really twofold. It's their own pa path, which is moving towards, you know, they've hit all those ideal areas for Whole Foods locations, and they've done very well there. But there's a finite amount of those. You know, the idea of like low-hanging fruit. Uh, they went to those places, those cities, those uh, urban areas where the demographics worked and everything else, and succeeded at opening up stores that people really like going to and, and spending a lot and everything else. A lot of money, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they have that criticism in some ways, but uh, just to kind of push back on that is it's, it's, it's what many of their customers wanted mm -hmm. or demanded or wanted to show up and do. Um, so, uh, but the, I think one of the things that drove, I mean, the landscape has changed and their ability to generate strong sales growth, their ability to be more profitable than most other grocers for a certain amount of time, uh, not surprisingly, attracts entrants. Yeah. And the current world is very different. Uh, you don't, you know, we not only see Sprouts and the fresh market, but Kroger, uh, Costco, Target, you know, here in Texas, HEB, and even Walmart are pushing hard into this organic, uh, organic, natural, that, that broader category. So Whole Foods is kind of coming to a harder point for it to grow. Um, and up against a level of competition that's very different from what it faced in its, you know, multiple years of, of, of phenomenal performance in many ways. Did it have first mover advantage when it came to the organic food market? Yeah, I would say that's a driver of the success is that they had, had an idea, executed on that idea very well, and, um, you know, per performed uh, very well as a result of that. Mm -hmm. In my financial statement analysis class, we kind of talk about the distinction between first mover advantage and a sustainable competitive advantage where, you know, in the initial years, they look identical. But mm -hmm. what are you doing with a sustainable competitive advantage that keeps you, gives you the ability to keep doing it year after year after year and can keep others out? Mm -hmm. um, and undeniably, they performed well initially, but um, you know, and they were able to acquire wild oats in 2007 to kind of keep the competition low. But, I mean, today's world is so different. You, you can't acquire Walmart and Target and that's not, it's not possible. So, uh, you know, there are so many other players in that, uh, that space right now that that's hurt their performance in the last couple of years. 2016 was specifically bad. I think um, they had their same store sales growth was negative. Uh, and that's the only other time that they've had that was in 2009, in the middle of the recession. recession yeah. it's, it's actually something they've achieved even double digit growth on, which is phenomenal. Uh, they've had great historical sales per square foot, a common metric in retail of over wow. a thousand. And that has, with their new stores and everything they're adding, it's just, it's gone down significantly. But uh, it, it's, it's just a fundamentally different world than their heyday in many mm -hmm. ways. So. so on this side, Whole Foods is having trouble, and they're not growing as fast as their shareholders want. What's up with Amazon for the last 10 years? Yes. A fascinating company, by the way. They're doing so much. I don't even know what kind of company they are. Yeah, uh, in the middle of change, seemingly at all, at all times, mm -hmm. uh, and growth. I mean, they've, they've been... Uh, aggressively growing in, in different ways, pushing prime. Uh, they've expanded into third party, so not selling their own stuff, but actually you know, serving as a platform mm -hmm. uh, to sell the products of a v vast variety of merchants, which I think in many ways really enables them to achieve that, you know, everything from A to Z. If, if it's a platform that has a partnership with all these other merchants, uh, you can really sell a lot of stuff um, or, or give access to customers to so, so much stuff. And growing their third-party sales, growing their own sales, one of the things I would commend them for is that, you know, as they ventured into new areas, AWS, Amazon Fresh, you know, their, their core business hasn't faltered. Uh, they've been able to sort of sell things online in that traditional e-commerce, but then also expand outwards. And 
Um, so a lot of growth, and then one other thing they've been doing in the last couple of years is really been committed to you know, expanding capacity, mm -hmm. giving themselves the opportunity to grow more in the future, and also you know, committing to R&D and spending a ton, uh, you know, billions of dollars, 10, I think well over $10 billion a year on R&D. Um, so a, a strong commitment to, I would say in many ways, or the way I've interpreted that is, current growth, but also investing in the potential for future growth. How exceptional are those R&D investments? Because I, again, I, I should read more probably, as my mom would say, <laughs> but how exceptional is that amount of, or percentage of uh, R&D investment for a company? I, I think we need a benchmark there or a comparison group, but the challenge is that doesn't really exist for Amazon. I mean, a, a massive challenge you have with analyzing them, looking at them is, you know, there there aren't like an obvious set of peers. Well, you know, they're spending this much and their clearly defined peer group is spending this much, but it doesn't exist for Amazon. If we think about them as a retailer, uh, the amount of R&D is, is absurd. It's absurdly high. But they're not a retailer, right? They have this AWS arm yes. and everything else. So um, the dollar amount is large. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's actually, I think, if I'm correct, it's slightly larger than what Apple's was, which is, I, I think we would all see as an innovative, mm -hmm. you know, technology company in many ways, and therefore R&D is important to Apple. I don't want to make any comment about better or worse in terms of that you know, particular amount spent on R&D. It's just that, except noting the fact that you know, compared to a traditional retailer, Amazon is doing many other things, and this is a part of that. And they're committed to spending you know, billions on R&D. I'd love to be able to say it's this many times the nearest competitor, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, challenging company. Fascinating company, but challenging company. So why did they pick Whole Foods? How does that make sense in terms of Amazon's strategy with delivering food and maybe Prime Now, and also the impact on Whole Foods? Well, let's talk about Amazon's strategy first. Yeah, at some point these come together, and yeah. I've actually said this in my class, like well, I, I'll have to... Uh, Slowly leave them? Yeah, and, and move out of Whole Foods on its own because it won't be uh, independently reported. But the, the challenge there is... Uh, you know, the, when do, how do we separate them and can we do that? But I think we can still do that now. So m my opinions, and that's really all they are here, but trying to come to the table with some thoughtfulness in the whole process. But my, my opinions are that uh, a couple things that those stores present, and um, the general idea here is the locations, where Whole Foods are is one aspect that sets them apart from other, like why not another grocery store, mm -hmm. whatever else? Um, and their locations are in high traffic, generally speaking, uh, upper income, you know, on average, I don't want to stereotype all of their customers, but uh, higher income distributions or, or disposable income, high foot traffic in, in terms of urban areas. Um, so those things from a retailer's perspective, uh, present the opportunity for more revenue. More people come in, more people spend more, people are less price sensitive. They're in those areas, the Whole Foods stores already, and they have a much higher concentration in urban and sort of wealthier suburban or you know, the, the mix between urban and, and suburban. I'm, I'm not sure the exact term there, but you know, they're in highly concentrated populated areas. Um, and so there's a lot of people that are current or potential Amazon customers around that Whole Foods store already. Um, and a thought there is that, you know, what will this do for those customers? Will they... What do you mean when you say potential Amazon customers? Are these people who want to get Prime or subscribe to um, Prime Now? Sorry, do the opposite. What do you mean potential Amazon customers? I don't know what they want, yeah. but I think the, the reality is they, there are likely a great testing grounds for Amazon in a lot of ways. Because okay. when we're talking about price and sensitivity and some of those other aspects, uh, it may be a, a, a demographic that's easier in some ways to sell things to, maybe potentially more uh, familiar with, comfortable with the idea of shopping online. Mm -hmm. um, and so that presents some 
some opportunities for those two companies to work together well. Uh, but, but another thought there with the locations is, uh, and I, I wonder this point, which is like how and where will our shopping behaviors change? Um, you know, will we always want to be, have the experience of shopping, of touching, of seeing, of, of picking up? Um, and then there's the logistical challenge of delivering groceries, which is very different than delivering, you know, the, a lot of the goods that Amazon currently sells tons of, where there's you know perishability and timing. Will you be home to pick up the order, bring it in, and put it oh, in your that's freezer? Annoying. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't work out like anything that ships in a brown box should be you know, the same. So a, a question is: Is this actually a you know a way for them to manage costs because that last mile? The customers can go at their convenience to either pick up groceries or maybe shop themselves. Um, so that's a, the locations may be a way of enabling them to be a part of brick and mortar, which is the way I see this. This isn't going to be shutting down a competitor to push people online uh, with grocery sales. I see it more as an opportunity to uh, embrace the brick and mortar aspect and bring that into the sort of Amazon Umbrella. goal yeah, of, of selling stuff to people. I mean, which I would so say that that's, that's what that's, Amazon that's does. That's what they right. do. Uh, and uh, so, so that's my thought there. Um, and the other thing I think that Whole Foods is different from is uh, they, and I, there are exceptions here, just to be clear. And Central Market's a great one here in Central Texas, Central Market run by HEB. But... Whole Foods is set up to be an experience in many ways. It's not a chore of grocery shopping, you know, get in and get out as fast as we can. Um, have you been to the down, the one? The downtown one? Yeah, here It's been a while. I like Trader Joe's. Um, but but there, if you go there, it's like, it's almost overwhelming, like, what else you could do? There's yeah, ice skating, that's true. There's a bar. There's, mm -hmm. You can drink a beer while you shop. You can... Uh, you, you can take yoga classes, cooking classes. And so an argument there is uh, why Whole Foods is they offer the opportunity, the experience of shopping more than just the, I need to get my groceries. It becomes part of a lifestyle, potentially? Potentially, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I wonder if Amazon uh, is moving in this acquisition because, you know, could they bring this in where the Whole Foods stores become these distribution hubs? And in the distribution hubs, we can try out products, test stuff out, look at new electronics, um, think about how the newest version of AI and Alexa works to do basic things. And so there's a showcasing element of that experience. Um, and if we're already going to Whole Foods and willing to get a meal or spend time with friends or meet up or get a coffee at that specific location, the opportunity to, uh, you know, just add parts to that experience. And I realize all this is a, you know, it's with the goal of driving us to buy more things, but um, so That's is what life. business does, yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> so is life. I, I don't want to sort of, you know, critique that idea, but, but we like buying things, mm -hmm. uh, and they meet that goal in many ways. But uh, so, so I wonder if it's that unique aspect of Whole Foods that makes them even more attractive, which is a, a meeting point. And it's an opportunity to interact with the things we buy, whether that's you know, picking up food or not, I'm not sure, but showcasing electronics or clothing or even just facilitating uh, you know, an easier opportunity to return things. We, we ordered some clothes online via Amazon. We don't want them or they didn't fit or whatever else. And now it's, a, it's not two or three errands, it's one, uh, which, which is potential value to the customer. Do you think that now you can order Whole Foods through Prime Now and get them on in your house in two hours. Is that a potential strategy for Amazon? That's a it's a great question. Um, I, it's got to be a something that they are thinking about at a level that you know I'm I, I'm not going to pretend that I can even be at. But uh, I, I think the question there is is. is ultimately, are we wanting to try to move groceries online? I don't think in the short term. Although there are some opportunities where that could work, but, but, but my, my assessment is that, you know, that we'll still be using those brick and mortar stores to engage in the, the experience of shopping uh, for food specifically. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious about that. 
um, sort of when and how or would this shift occur? Uh, but but I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I just, my, my, my thought would just be that the brick and mortar piece of all this is, is going to stick around for some amount of time. And, and another layer to that is I wonder if we, uh, if we as humans still, it's crazy I guess, but we still like the opportunity to interact with other humans and going to Whole Foods to get a meal. We, we could have done this at Whole Foods. This is a much nicer setting. <laughs> we, we could have been up there and grabbed sure. a coffee uh -huh. and, and done whatever else. And will we always value... Uh, the experience of meeting other people or the experience of a store? I think it's the store is facilitating the opportunity to... It sounds mm -hmm. crazy, but to be social and not just to be, you know, uh, hiding away in our pajamas, uh, ordering things online, yeah. and then you know only opening up the door when we hear a knock to pick up that package. Yeah. There. that could be a very lonely existence mm -hmm. if, if we don't ever have to, uh, you know, our basic necessities, which we're still buying in brick and mortar stores, are you know, delivered right to our door. Absolutely, and everything now is moving to on demand. Movies, music cars, food, all sorts of entertainment. Now that, I wonder what's left, friends? <laughs> yeah. What would you say to people who are now thinking Amazon has AWS, has a huge um, just platform where people sell everything and they're moving into food. I remember a friend telling me about 70 years ago that hey, uh, no, five years ago, hey, don't buy a Kindle, buy it from uh, bookstores, supports your local economy. With this move into Whole Foods and Amazon owning more space in very different industries, what would you say to people who are like, this is monopoly, shut it down, someone do something? It, it, it's, it's definitely a concern. Um, and, you know, one which will have to be addressed uh, going forward. Uh, I'm not a lawyer by any means, but my understanding of the problem specifically with monopolies is the ability to control the market and therefore uh, move to away from competitive pricing. So increased prices, basically, the, the idea of price gouging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know what the future holds, but it seems so far that the opposite has occurred. <laughs> that the answer is, that, well, the opposite has occurred now, but what will happen in six mm -hmm. years, I don't know. But, but we haven't really, we have not seen, uh, you know, these massive increases in prices as, as Amazon's size and, and, and scope has grown. Um, but it's, uh, you know, that idea is, is certainly uh, something to consider and, you know, I, I hope always is taken seriously uh, by the regulators to, just to, to make sure that, you know, that the anti-competitive practices aren't mm -hmm. happening yet. But, but, but I also see a distinction between a, a definitively anti-competitive practice and just growing. Uh, and, and this is clearly growth. And again, I don't know what the future will hold, but, but I do want to uh, separate those two. Um, but, but another thing that you know, I just think about often as a, as a business professor, but then as a consumer and as an individual and, 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 and all those other things and lots of conversations with friends and family, whatever else. Uh, you know, but at the core, uh, Amazon seems to have been on a trajectory where it sells us stuff that you know, we want, we yep. demand. It's not forcing us to, to buy prime. Um, it's not forcing us to... Uh, to enjoy those things, and you know, I would, I, I, my family does subscribe to Prime, and I would say it's definitively um, convenient in some way. Extremely, so we benefit from that. Another thing, this I've was seen, Amazon Prime. Socks for Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah. yeah, lots of stuff. It's easy to do, um, but but it's not just. It's valuable because if you think about it in some ways, and, and I'm curious where grocery will go in the long run, um, the value to the consumer, independent of the prices, is you know the less time you have to spend driving around and shopping, uh, that does free up opportunities to spend more time with your family. To you know, errands are not something that on their own, at least to me, uh, you know, bring some high level of. Mm -hmm enjoyment of life but but the nice thing is when you replace those you you do have more time to be on the internet basically <laughs> well yeah how you use it is, yeah that's up to me uh, it's up to yeah. Yeah, the individual right uh, so and i'm not saying it's definitively higher quality of life but just it is more time mm -hmm. so putting on your consumer hat so if i walk tomorrow i wake up 
I can get food delivered in the morning. Um, I can get coffee delivered. I can get pizza. Any, I need batteries. I need a charger for my phone. I can get that delivered. Um, music, YouTube, I don't have to do cable TV. I don't have to ha have a car. I can get Uber. Do you think that businesses down the line which create experiences for their customers are going to be more profitable because that's what people want. For example, I have two stores close to me which have coffee. Same coffee, I don't know the difference really, but I go to the store which is more East Austin, more hipster where I know people and I like the experience. Do you see that growth in consumer experience? I don't have any specific knowledge or, or, or facts to kind of back that up, but, but everything you mentioned seems to make sense. Uh, I would only see it in two ways, though, which is the first thing, I think you're talking about the specific social experience mm -hmm. of liking spending time with people who have similar interest and whatever else. That's part of an experience. Another part of the experience, though, is this the convenience aspect of it, which is it, it makes something easier for me or more enjoyable. You know, I'm, I'm getting a meal at a restaurant because the chef is going to be able to cook it. It's not only more convenient in terms of not washing dishes, whatever else, but you know, whatever what's going to be prepared by a chef is going to be much better than I would have made myself. And so those things have been, a, I mean, clearly have been a part of society, and I, I it's, I mean, the service aspect looks like it's growing in all ways. I, I wish I had, you know, specific data points to, to get at there. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but I agree with you. I, I think that that's, you know, the, those aspects of society will continue to grow in many ways. And, and if we consider the idea of having more time from, you know, shopping less or doing more mundane errands, that does potentially free you up to spend more time on these experiences. But as you spend more time on the experiences, that gives the opportunity for a business to sort of meet that specific need. So an interesting anecdote that I have about uh, you know, prices and is it a monopoly or whatever else is I, uh, so we needed a little piece for our car, the little motor for the window console. And uh, I called up a dealership and they told me it would, I think the total cost would be like $160 for the parts and then the labor. And of course, I'd have to drive to and from. Um, and then I just decided that seemed like a lot to me, although they told me it was inexpensive. Um, I looked on Amazon, found the part with a, you know 30 seconds, maybe a minute of searching. Uh, it was $6 and went over to YouTube. Uh, Played around until I found the video of somebody installing it and watched that and got it shipped from Amazon in a couple days and put it in and it was easy to do and it was fascinating to me because at that moment I realized or I thought about the idea of how much other how many other areas have they actually drastically reduced prices or potentially information asymmetry because what they brought to my fingertips was the ability to know this tiny little piece is only worth five or six dollars, not ninety dollars. And moreover, the service was, you know, two little screws. It wasn't something, I mean, obviously there are things that are well beyond my ability, but it, it wasn't a labor intensive or skill specific thing. So I'm curious as you see this company bring together so many products with third party, with groceries, with whatever else, to what extent um, that helps enhance the customer life beyond convenience just by giving us better information, uh, better access to, if we want it, the opportunity to search out, to learn, to see firsthand that, you know, this, this thing doesn't cost all that much. Interesting. I'd love to end it at that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Did you get Thank everything? You. Thank you.